Many of you met them or saw them here last year, and we've worked with Chris and Cindy now in oops, two churches, uh, myself at our previous church as well as here. Chris and Cindy are missionaries in the Dominican Republic with a ministry called Time Ministries, and I'll let them explain what all that might possibly mean. But they've been there now for seven years, and they do a tremendous program that allows people just like you and me, just average old American folks mainly, to come on a short-term mission trip to the Dominican Republic. They fully equip you, they teach you, they show you, they work with you. And in the process of the week that you were there, you will build a chapel and uh, some benches that will be put into chapels. And then uh, depending on the scheduling and timing and where it's at in construction, you'll even get to go out and build that, t- that chapel on site. And these are chapels that are given away to people who otherwise they could not afford a place of worship on their own. They might be meeting in a house, they might be meeting under a tree, they might be meeting who knows where. And so it's a tremendous blessing to these folks that we can partner with them and and enable them to have a place of worship, um, to get in out of the sun and out of the rain and all those sorts of things. So really, really cool program. I'm not going to steal all the thunder by telling everything about it. They've got some neat stories. So um, I just welcome this as Chris and Cindy Anderson, their two little ones, Paul and um, Sophia are running around somewhere, so let's make them welcome. Give them a hand. Okay. Oh, sounds like it's working. Excellent. We'll get all of our technology set up here, but uh, we'll keep we'll keep our hard copy right there. All right. Remote control. All right, let's see what happens. Okay, well, it is uh, truly a blessing to, uh, to be here. Feliz cumpleaños. There's some Spanish for you for Pastor Chris's birthday. Happy birthday in Spanish. And we'd like to say Dios le bendiga, bonjour bonu, and God bless you in the three languages that, uh, that are spoken in the Dominican Republic, of course, Spanish and uh, French Creole uh, among the Haitian population, and of course, English. And, uh, and it is truly a blessing to, uh, to be invited back here again to share with you the wonderful things that God is allowing us to be uh, engaged in in the Dominican Republic. And one of the first questions may be, well, who are we and, and why are we here? And, uh, and, and Chris mentioned briefly uh, about that. I am actually a graduate of Cloquet Senior High School. Um, I won't mention what year, but uh, born, born and raised in Cloquet, Minnesota. I went to school at St. Cloud State University, um, spent, uh, worked for several years down in, in Minneapolis and Roseville. So I am a Minnesotan, and uh, hopefully my uh, accent will, uh, will come back a little bit here. And so that's, uh, that's, that's my connection to, to the local area. But actually our connection to, uh, to Kim and Pastor Chris comes through Cindy, and I'll just let her briefly explain where, uh, where that connection came from. Yes, well, I had the great opportunity uh, to graduate from New Prague High School, which is just south of the cities. And from there, I went on to Drake University, and that is where I met Kim. And Kim and I were in InterVarsity together. And that is also um, the opportunity where I learned about Time Ministries, which God led us down a very significant path after that experience in 96. But Kim and I um, both served in InterVarsity together, and then also we worked together at a museum down in Des Moines. And so over the years, I know we lost uh, connection, but then we reconnected as um, her and Chris were called to... Um, Wasika, Minnesota, and my aunt and uncle lived there for a few years. And so as we would go down and visit my aunt and uncle in Wasika, then also we got a chance to reconnect with Chris and Kim at that point. So it's been great to see their ministry grow and how God has been calling them and serving in this ministry here now in glory. Amen. All right. It's amazing to see God bringing, uh, bringing things together so many years after, after he starts, and hopefully as, as we share a little bit today, uh, there may be things going on in your life, there may be things that have gone on in the past, and you never know when God is going to use those things for his glory, um, and that nothing happens, uh, happens by accident. What I wanted to start off with today is to, is to share a little bit about our ministry and, uh, and, and, and what we do, and then 
take some stories from this past year, some things that have happened over the course of the past year, and, um, and, and share some of that as well. Normally, we start off our program by asking people if they know where the Dominican Republic is because, you know, you don't hear a whole lot about it except over the past several weeks with hurricanes traveling around. Oh, if you've been paying any attention to the news, uh, you, may, you may have heard about that. And, of course, the Dominican Republic is on the same island as Haiti, uh, about two hours southeast of Florida. And we did, as Pastor Chris mentioned, we did uh, survive pretty well. Uh, Irma passed further off the north coast than was expected. And so in Santo Domingo, the southern side of the island where we're located really was was uh, of no significance at all. Uh, the northern coast did get a little bit of flooding and, and some rain. Uh, and there were some people displaced from their homes, but by and large uh, avoided some of the destruction that, that you've seen on, on the other Caribbean islands. So please continue to pray uh, for them. As well as, uh, as well as Texas and Florida, where we have a lot of groups that come and serve with us from. And they're going to have their, their, own, uh, their own work to do over the, uh, over the coming months. Time Ministries has, has two locations. Uh, we're located in Monterey, Mexico, which is where the ministry started back in 1968. And uh, then we also have the location where Cindy and I serve in the Dominican Republic. And Time Ministries as an organization was formed in 1968, but our origins go back many years before that. Our founders, Zerrell and Doretta Brown, who are graduates of Northwestern uh, uh, down in the cities, they, they came to the Dominican Republic in 1947 and started pretty much the first Baptist work on that island. And most all of the Baptist churches down there nowadays have their origin back from the work that they started in that time. Uh, after several years in the Dominican, they went over to Cuba and served there until Castro took over. They felt it wasn't safe to return, and that's when they went into Mexico, started serving in Monterey, and in 68 formed Time Ministries. After 30 years of, of ministry there, they came back to the Dominican Republic in 1992 and started the ministry that, that we are a part of to this day. And uh, here is, these are, are two very interesting pictures. Of course, the one on the left is before they left for the mission field with their, uh, what did she say it was, a, 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 30, uh, a 38 Ford or something like that with a pump organ strapped to the top. They shipped that down on a boat. They got on a plane and made three or four stops before they actually got to Cuba uh, with two young children. And, uh, and then the picture on the right, Doretta just celebrated her 94th birthday. And she is still active and serving in ministry, comes down and works with the groups. And it is, it is just incredible to have such a legacy uh, to talk with, to hear stories about, about the ministry and, and her history and her and Zerrell. Her husband, Zerrell, passed away in 1968, excuse me, 1996, 1996. And, uh, but yet Doretta has continued on working with the ministry. And it is, it is such a blessing to, uh, to still have her with us. The, uh, the purpose of time is, first of all, to glorify God, and that is what, what we should be doing in any of the activities that we're involved in. Uh, the way that we do that at Time Ministries is by leading short-term groups to the mission field. We want to work with groups and give them an, an experience in short-time missions. And this has two benefits. It benefits the nationals, the local churches in the DR, uh, by, through construction and evangelism and discipleship. Uh, the construction aspect, some of you have, have heard before, we build chapels for pastors that are in need. As Pastor Chris mentioned, they may be meeting under a mango tree. Uh, and mangoes can be deadly when they fall more than about 10 feet. So uh, they may be meeting under those trees, under a tarp, under a tin shed. And through the help of, of groups that come down from churches like yours, in one week they're able to build a structure like you see here, a 20 by 28 foot uh, wooden chapel that serves that pastor and congregation as they grow until they can afford to build a concrete block structure. Yes. And <laughs> we have a one and a half year old. We know exactly what that's like. Um, the groups will, will also conduct evangelism, evangelistic outreaches. So we'll do VBS camps. We will do sports ministry. Uh, we'll do uh, Jesus film showings. Uh, we'll do medical clinics, eyeglass clinics. Any way of getting the gospel to people 
where they are and where their needs are. And the groups will participate in that. And then finally, we have a discipleship aspect. The groups don't get to see that very much, but these are the locals that we're working with, the staff and the volunteers and the interns that come down and help us with the ministry. Uh, They are being discipled on a day-to-day basis and learning about what it's like to serve, to be a missionary in the hopes that they will feel the call to serve in their local churches or uh, become missionaries themselves, which, which has already happened. The second component then of our ministry, besides helping the locals then, is for the benefit of the groups and the churches that, that they come from. We hope that through this experience, they'll deepen their vision of missions, become more active locally in their own churches, or perhaps be called to full-time ministry somewhere else, maybe, maybe across the world, but maybe in their own home, in their own school, in their own workplace, uh, places that, that you would call their comfort zone, but yet sharing the gospel in those places is often more frightening than it is going halfway across the world. So we hope that as, as, as a part of our ministry, this will benefit uh, the local churches that come and serve with us as well. All right, well, this didn't line up very well, did it? So um, we're going to talk, I think, you want to sit down if you want, or you want to stand <laughs> Cindy's going to share a couple of things here, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to talk about a few of them as, as well. But at Time Ministries, over the past few years, we have seen God really blessing um, the ministry and the work. Uh, we've seen more groups coming. We've seen more opportunities arising. And so we've seen this growth, and we came up with this acronym, love acronyms, uh, called GROWTH, and each one of those stands for a certain part of our ministry. And we're going to share some of those here with you uh, with you today and hopefully encourage you to think about whether or not God is calling you to serve uh, in some increased capacity or perhaps to, uh, to come along with us at Time Ministries and serve on a short-term group, much as uh, Paul and Sue Anderson did back in, in January of this year. And, and before I forget, uh, just thank you all for praying for them. And, uh, and supporting them in their endeavor to come down. It was wonderful to have them serve with us, and, uh, and it was a, a, a blessed week of working with them. So we're going to start with, uh, with growth and, and the letter G. All right, and G is for God's plan. So we're going to take a look at a few passages of, of Scripture here. If you want to grab your Bibles or your smart devices and, and, and look up some of these. First one is going to be Proverbs 16.9. Proverbs 16.9. And, and there it says, In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. There's another one I don't, I don't have posted on here. It's Jeremiah 29.11, and many of you are, are probably familiar with that verse as well. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So as, as we think about the growth of our ministry and, uh, and, and what's going on, it's very easy for us to have a plan of what we want to do and where we see the Lord leading. But God has his, has his, has his own plan, and we always want to be sensitive to what that, uh, what that is. And one area where, where we see that is in the area of our local team in the Dominican Republic, our team of missionaries and staff. We started working there in in 2010. And at that time, there was a site director, an American site director who had just retired. And uh, Brother Noe here and his family in the upper right-hand corner of our picture, uh, he had become the site director at Time Ministries. And it was really just him and and his wife serving at the time and, uh, and, and Doretta. And we came on board, and our president, the, the president of time, not Mr. Trump, but uh, our, uh, our time president, he, uh, he knew that the, that the ministry needed more help. And the idea was that we needed more missionaries, more American missionaries to come down and, and help out with, with the ministry of time. And we even put a five-year plan together. And one of the things that came out of that five-year plan was you need more staff. You're going to start seeing more groups. You can't handle all these people coming, coming, coming down. Uh, and so you're going to need more staff. You need more Americans. So 
What happened? Well, we added more missionaries and more staff. But if you take a look at these pictures, they are not Americans. It turned out that they are Dominicans. Through the discipleship portion of our ministry, these Dominicans that would come on board as interns and help us out with the ministry, they would grow in the Lord and they would feel a call to service and want to serve with us either as staff or as missionaries. And so what, what our thought and what our plan was, bring more Americans down. We know how to do ministry. We know how to do, do missions. Um, God had a different plan of raising up the people who know their culture best, the local Dominicans. And it has been such a, a blessing to be a part of that and to see that happening. And, and that, that really encourages us. At some point we say, well, boy, are we working ourselves out of a job, out of, out, out of a ministry? But, but it's, 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 it's a blessing because now we see opportunities to take the ministry to other places. Whereas before, without all, all these, these other folks coming on board, being called into ministry, uh, we would not have those opportunities. God would not have provided those opportunities to go perhaps into Haiti and to Cuba and to other, other countries around the world. Who knows? There are plenty of pastors that are in need of chapels and, and help. And now, with this increase in, in staff, we are, are seeing an opportunity to, to do that and leave the local ministry there to the Dominicans to operate. So that is, uh, I believe, the first, uh, the first one, letter G, for God's plan. The second one is going to be uh, be ready, and that is in Luke 12.35. Okay. Cindy and I split this up, and we were up uh, a little bit late last night uh, wrapping everything up, and so we weren't always on the same on the same page. Somebody else kept us up talking too, but that was it. Pi. It turned out that pie was offered, and I wound up. Uh, we wound up staying up a little bit later talking. So we're in Luke twelve thirty-five. Luke twelve thirty-five. All right. So here it says, "Be dressed and ready for service, and keep your lamps burning." like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. And then if you jump down into verse 40, uh, Jesus is saying, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Well, this relates a little bit to, uh, to our call into missions, to uh, Cindy and my uh, call into missions. And... We had been involved on uh, short-term mission trips for, for many years. Uh, we went to Romania three times. We had, we had come down to the Dominican Republic a couple of times. We were involved at our mission committee and mission board at, at, at the churches that we had attended. And the, the question that visiting missionaries would always ask us is, well, what do you guys think about, about, be, about being missionaries? You know, you seem interested in it. You like doing it. And my response is always the same. Well, not right now. Uh, our ducks aren't all in a row yet. They're not even in the same pond. Um, you know, in the future, maybe when, when, you know, when everything's ready, then we'll make that decision. We'll, we'll, become, we'll become missionaries. And uh, it turned out that, that, again, God had a plan for that. And I was laid off from, from the job that I had worked at for about 12 years. And for about a year, we were wondering what to do, where to go. Should we pack up and move someplace? Um, and... About one year after this had happened, uh, uh, Noe and, and this previous site director were traveling through Des Moines, it, it just so happened, and uh, we hadn't seen them for many years. We just wanted to go out for coffee and find out what was going on, and they asked the question, do you want to become missionaries? Are you, is, is God calling you now to be full-time missionaries? He's taking care of your job. <laughs> um, and that was the first time that I really sat back and said, wow, maybe... God is doing something here. And Cindy and I prayed about it. The time president, who I mentioned before, he just so happened to live in Des Moines as well so we could meet with him and find out what, what the needs for, for the ministry were. And God kept opening doors, right? And the challenge became not so much that, that we were going to move to another country, uh, to a place where we didn't know the language and we didn't know the culture. We didn't, really didn't know anything about it. 
But the fact was, what are we going to do with all of our stuff? All right. Now, we had been, been married for, uh, for about uh, for 12 years by that point, right? 2010, 12 years. Um, and, uh, and it was just the two of us. We had a dog and a cat and a house full of stuff. What do we do with this stuff? Okay. It was holding us back. We weren't living in a way that was making us ready to go and ready to serve. It was like the story of uh, a couple of stories in the New Testament where, um, you know, the rich man has to go and, and sell all of his things or the, um, the other man that says, well, let me, go, let me go bury my father and then I'll follow you, Jesus. Let me take care of this stuff and then I'll come. A lot of the things in our lives are holding us back from serving, whether it's in, in missions or it's just in ministry and serving the local churches. And so the question that you want to ask yourself is, are you ready? Are you living in a way that makes you ready? Especially young people as they're, as they're graduating from high school and thinking about college um, and, and, and you start deciding, what am I going to do? Step back and say, what does God want to do? And when he calls, am I going to be ready to go and ready to serve? Or am I going to have to take care of all this other stuff first? Are you ready spiritually? Are you ready financially? Are you, is your lifestyle, the kind of lifestyle that you're leading, ready for service? Because God is the one that is going to decide and call you when he thinks you're ready. All right, so something to keep in mind. Be ready. And now, Cindy is going to talk a little bit about the letter O in growth for opposition. So, of course, when you're standing before God and you feel that you're ready um, and you feel he has a plan and you've submitted to it, there's times when you have opposition and to really grow and that opposition makes you stronger. And there were times in our journey that we experienced opposition um, just after we submitted our missionary application. Um, Chris had a, a medical emergency and we had to be rushed to the ER and we're going, but God, you we just submitted everything. We just bought our flights to the DR where we feel like we're following your plan. But in through all of it, we needed to learn some lessons and face that opposition to then be stronger and to go forward. And so we're going to look at in this one, so did the Israelites face some opposition. And that is especially when they were rebuilding the wall, when Nehemiah felt the need and the desire to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall. And they were beginning to do it, but they didn't do it alone. They did it with one another. And then there were others on the sidelines that saw opposition. So we're going to look at Nehemiah 4, 1 through 6. In Nehemiah 4, 1 through 6. And it says, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. He mocked the Jews before his colleagues and the powerful men of Samaria. And he said, what are these pathetic Jews doing? Can they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they ever finish it? Can they bring these burnt stones back to life from the mounds of rubble? Then Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was beside him, said, Indeed, even if a fox climbed up what they are building, we could break down their stone walls. Listen, our God, for we are despised. Make their insults return on their own hands and let them be taken as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt or let their sin be erased for your sight, because they have provoked the builders. So we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had the will to keep working. And as we look at opposition, there are many times when we see that opposition, even where we are serving. And one particular story where we've seen that 
And the group actually overcame that opposition was this past summer. In the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a group picture. This is a group out of Southbrook uh, Church, and that is uh, near uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And their missions pastor, who's there in the uh, upper left also in the picture, um, Richard Hopkins, this man has given us even a fire for evangelism. This man is on fire. Wherever he'll go, the beach, um, the market, the store, wherever he is, he wants to share the gospel, and it's contagious with him. So as I was talking with him, part of my role is communication with leaders. And so I take their ideas of things they'd like to do, and I share them with the group, and we try to see if we can make them possible. And so Richard says, I would like to see if we can share the gospel on the street in the colonial city. Now, Santo Domingo is a city that was established in the late 1400s, early 1500s. And there's a lot of history with Columbus and um, the Spaniards. Now, with that um, area, there's a lot of people walking around. There's opportunities. There's um, often people playing music. And he's been there before. He says, I want to do it. So we looked into getting a permit because the last time they tried to do it, they couldn't do it. And so he said, okay, then we'll go on to the beach and we'll share the gospel. Then uh, this year he said, could you look into getting us a permit? I said, okay. So we had an intern um, that started looking. She started with her stepfather who works for a newspaper. He's a writer. Um, he gave her some leads. She called five to six offices and they said, no, you cannot. And so um, Richard prayed, and he came back, and he said, that is not going to stop us. So what they did is they went, and they went individual by individual, one by one, sharing the gospel. And he said, I know, even though we're going to go out and we're going to experience that culture of the Dominican Republic, we want to share the gospel and we're not going to let the opposition of anything stand in our way and i believe a few people um accepted christ that day and heard the gospel in most important the gospel was reached the seed was planted and even through that opposition of hearing no you can't um you can't receive a permit they still did it and they still followed god's plan they were ready and they overcame that opposition. Amen. God be praised. All right. Willingness. G-R-O-W. Willingness. If you are willing. We're going to take a look at Matthew. And we're going to Matthew 8, 2, and 3. And this is, um, this is where the, the men with leprosy are, are, are asking for healing from Jesus. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Well, this summer we had a group that was willing, willing to, to do almost anything in order to provide a pastor with a chapel. Uh, this is a group from New Life Church, New Life Christian Church in Hudson, New Hampshire. And they have been coming to the Dominican Republic with Time Ministries for many, many years. And back before 2010, around 2008, 2009, they were the first group that was able to go into Haiti and build a chapel. Now, um, if you if you follow Time Ministries or, or recall from from before, we build these chapels uh, in in modular panels. We prefabricate everything at our at our central location where the group stay, and then at the end of the week, we load all those pieces on a truck and take them out to the site. And in about five or six hours, that pastor has has a chapel. And so 
before the, the big earthquake in 2010, they had managed to go into Haiti a couple of times and build a chapel. But after the, after the earthquake, because of all the aid that was going across the border from the Dominican into Haiti, the, the border officials realized, hey, we could charge a few bribes on all this stuff coming through and make a little bit of money. So the next time that we tried to go into Haiti just after the earthquake to build a chapel, they wanted $5,000 at the border uh, in order for us to bring this chapel across. Of course, we didn't have that kind of bribery money, so we had to bring it back. That shut the door for us going into Haiti at the time. God had a plan, though, because he connected us with Haitian pastors that were living in the Dominican Republic, and we were able to build for those communities, those little Haitian communities that were in the DR. But this group, they, they had always wanted and prayed about going, being able to go back into Haiti and, and to serve those pastors. And at this point, uh, we don't have a center in Haiti. So if we want to do work there, we've got to start in, in um, San Domingo where we are and take the pieces over there. So a lot of things started coming together and things that had been happening over the past few years. We had met a pastor who was building building chapels and we were building chapels for near the border of Haiti. He made some connections with the local government uh, office and the border officials there. It was kind of a Wild West area. You, you could almost imagine there's not a whole lot of control. And finally, this year, we were able to get across the border. Well, this group, first of all, they had to be willing to drive about, uh, about six hours uh, from where we are. Um, and actually turned into a nine-hour trip because we got a flat tire on the bus. They had to be willing to sleep on the floor of, of a chapel with really no showers, no, no anything. Here you can see our, our sleeping headquarters. We had guys and girls. The only thing separating us was the row of chairs there. So, so you had to be uh, uh, willing and open to do that. And, uh, and then to build that chapel, but... God be praised for Pastor Jacques Andres, who'd been waiting for a chapel for several years, uh, meeting his needs and meeting the desires of this group from New Hampshire. We're finally able to get back across the border into Haiti and build a chapel for the first time in seven years. So they were willing to be patient and, and wait on the Lord. And so you can ask yourselves this question, are you willing Okay, are you willing to go? Are you willing to wait? Sometimes the, it's harder when we hear God say wait than it is when he says no. <laughs> All right. Are you willing to pray? Are you willing to support? If you can't go, can you pray? Can you support those that want to? Those are questions that will help you grow. T, we're getting close to the end now. G-R-O-W-T, be transformed. Cindy's going to share a little bit about that. And in being transformed, we have to be willing to change. We have to be willing to change the ways that we do things and as we shared in our Sunday school, to look at, as Paul says, to be all things to all people so that we may win them to Christ. And we're going to look at Romans um, 12, and let's also look at Romans uh, 12, 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. And he says, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to be present, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And um, one of the churches that we partner with, and it's the main partner church that our building is right next door, and it's a picture of it there in the upper right, and um, the pastor of this church, Rudy, Pastor Rudy, is um, really the spiritual grandson for Zerl and Doretta. When they started their ministry in the 1940s and early 50s, their first convert 
led Pastor Rudy to the Lord as an eight-year-old boy. And so he is their spiritual grandson. So as he's grown up and planted several different churches, but this one out where we serve in the north part of Santo Domingo, um, he has been there for over 20 years. And with this particular church, um, many of the youth said, well, you know, can we change the worship music? Can we try some new things? Can we try to use tablets and iPhones or smartphones? And he's, you know, um, he's more, let's have a Bible. I want you to bring a solid Bible to church, please. And so one, um, one particular day I got a call from a man. Um, he's there in the lower right in the blue polo, and his name is Marcus Brooks. He is one of the directors of the ministry, the Jesus Film Project. And many of you may have heard of the Jesus Film Project as it has been going into countries and in remote areas for decades. And one of the things that they have done now is they have put it on your smartphones. And they have been able to take the movie of the Jesus Film and put it into short clips, just two, three minutes long. And with those short clips... They'll go on the street and, you know, they'll stop and talk to somebody and start kind of asking what they know. And they said, hey, can I show you a clip for you? And it's just two, three minutes. Can I just show this to you? And then I'll ask you a few questions. People are like, sure, you can do that. So when they do that, they have the opportunity to then share the gospel. So when Marcus contacted us and his church, his home church from Des Moines, Iowa was coming down, they said, I have always wanted to serve with my home church. Can we come down and serve with you and have an opportunity to share with you the Jesus Film Project? So they came down. And so I went next door and talked to Pastor Rudy and said, could they share in your Bible Institute about how to share the gospel? And that's the key for Pastor Rudy. He is an evangelist. He is there to share the gospel and to share it. And he was open to it. So some of the youth in church said, how did Pastor Rudy accept you sharing the gospel on a tablet, on an iPhone? And I said, because it's sharing the gospel. He wanted to transform his congregation. So Marcus and his wife, Shannon, came down, did a training for over 50 people. And after that, over all those people went then into the streets for 45 minutes and eight people came to know the Lord and they and so the opportunities to when you allow God to allow you to be transformed to think differently and I know it says do not be conformed to this age so we don't need to be conformed to the thinking of this world but we need to be transformed in what God wants us to do. And so we continue to use the film and also the tablets. In the lower left, um, our intern, Carol, is sharing the gospel with a woman during an eyeglass clinic. And in that particular day, there was an eyeglass clinic. Um, there was a woman that had been attending that church where we did the clinic, and they, that woman had been going for a while, but it was something particular in the application that Carol shared that was just a light bulb going off. And she accepted Christ that day. And so we want to not only meet physical needs with the construction, with eyeglasses, with medical needs, or with a VBS program, but it's also meeting the physical needs. And there's so many options out there that allow us to be transformed and to see what God's going to do. So if you're interested in that application, if you've got an iPhone or a smartphone, you can download it. And there's another one called God Tools. And that one, we can take the scripture right into Spanish and show and how to walk them through the four spiritual laws. And that has been immense because sometimes you're always flipping through your Bible and trying to say, oh, yeah, I want to go to this scripture, this scripture. In God Tools, 
You can flip right through, and it goes through each of the four spiritual laws, and both of those tools have been immeasurable in being able to share the gospel. And so um, I invite you to download them, see them, if you're sharing with people at work or at here, at home, or friends or family. But these applications have been incredible across the world. And um, the application for the Jesus Film Project is in over 1,400 languages. And so it's being shared across the world. So it was a pleasure for us to be able to serve with Marcus and Shannon in March. And we continue to um, pray for this ministry as we hope to continue to share the Jesus film in the Dominican Republic and share the impact of the gospel there. All right. Amen. Uh, one of the neat things just mentioning about that, too, it, uh, they provided us with a backpack, a Jesus film in a backpack. So in a standard school size backpack, they've got um, a, a screen and the, uh, the, the projector, which is no bigger than, than, than this Bible here, a battery pack. It has a, a solar panel for charging. Um, the, the actual film and, and, and the data are on, a, on one of the mini smart, smart cards, SD cards. And, and it's just amazing that, that you could throw this on your back get on a motorcycle, go up to the mountains somewhere, and, and show this film to people. And again, a, a, a great use of, of technology that, that, that so often we end up on Facebook for, for hours at a time, but using that technology for the kingdom and, and for his glory. All right, well, finally, we come to the letter H, G-R-O-W-T-H. As we grow, we need to be humble. We're going to take a look at 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7. Excuse me, not 5 through 7. Uh, the, sec the second half of 5. Um, but this is good advice for any of the younger folks in here too. We'll start with, with 5. Young men in the same way be submissive to those who are older. Our children are learning this too. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Well, I want to talk a little bit about a man who believes he's the humblest person in the world. Uh, no, just kidding. Uh, but he really is. This, uh, this is uh, Pastor Carlos and his wife, Sarah. And we have been working with them for several years in, in, in the ministry in the Dominican Republic. Uh, he was formerly a pastor of a, a, a pretty big church, a pretty affluent church in Santo Domingo, in the Dominican Republic. And he got connected to a small village called Pica Pica, which is about 45 minutes west of Santo Domingo, up in the, uh, up in the hills. And as he went out to that village, he really began to feel called to serving there full time. And so he, uh, and when we first met them in 2010, uh, this was their church. It was basically an open air pavilion with, uh, with a, a tin roof. And he had got, gotten into contact with, with us at Time Ministries, was in need of a chapel, uh, prior to this, they were one of those groups that was meeting under, under a dangerous mango tree, and, uh, and they at least were able to build this, uh, this structure them, themselves. And over time, we were able to provide them with three chapels on this campus where they're located. Uh, they also have a basketball court there. But in talking with, with Pastor Carlos, again, he's such a, a humble person. This is a man that uh, that could be public speaking uh, around the world when public speaking um, he went to Bob Jones University but he is, he is a Dominican and and it, it's just uh, amazing his uh, his personality because he's so humble and so thankful for anything that that he has and I'm sure that he has contacts that if he needed something he could immediately make a phone call 
or, or, or perhaps even call a family member and have that provided. But he has decided to lay all of that aside, he and his wife, and serve in this, uh, in this community of, of Pika Pika. And over the years, since 2010, when we first met him, God has blessed the ministry immensely. Uh, in addition to, to the three chapels that they have on their campus, they have a basketball court. Uh, they were able to plant a ministry a few miles away and build another chapel where someone from this particular campus is now serving. And just this past summer, we were able to build a pavilion for another uh, pastor that is working with him to start Bible studies and uh, children's programs under this, under this pavilion. And, and to imagine that he does not want a big church. He doesn't have hopes of building a big concrete structure that's going to seat three or 400 people. What he wants to do is to keep planting churches in this area and moving on and moving on and moving on. And the humility that, uh, that it takes uh, in order to have that kind of a vision uh, is, is just amazing to see down there. And it's great. You, you really, it's infectious. You want to be a part of that. You want to serve them more and help them more in their calling to ministry. So, the question is, are we being humble? Okay. Are we, are we surrendering our pride? Are we surrendering our pride? Are we surrendering our control? Are we surrendering our comfort? Whether it's a physical, uh, a physical comfort of, of, of air conditioning and, and hot water for a few days um, to serve uh, in, in a ministry. Are we willing to be persecuted? All right. And I'm not talking about, about persecution that perhaps you hear of, of, of pastors that are, that are serving in Muslim countries, dangerous locations, al- although there is that too. But the persecution that perhaps many of you face when you try to talk to a family member about Jesus, when you try to talk to somebody at work about spiritual things, those people that you see every single day and your relationship is going to change when you start sharing those kind of things with them. And are you willing to continue doing that? So, growth. Are we willing to grow? Submit to God's plan. Are we living our lives in a way that we are ready to serve? All right. Are we willing to, are we, are we willing, are we willing to face opposition? Are we willing to be transformed? And are we willing to be humble to serve in ministry? It, uh, it has been a blessing to serve with time over the past, uh, the past seven years. Um, it has had its challenging periods. Uh, ministry is a lot like any other, any other kind of work that, that you are involved in. Uh, you, you face uh, challenges day by day. And yet with God's grace, we're able to, to make it through. And these, this growth that God is, is providing us opportunities for, new countries, more staff, we just ask for your prayers for that, that God would show us the direction that he wants the ministry to go. We have our vision and we have our ideas, but for that communication, for, for God to really reveal to us clearly what he wants us to do, when he wants to do it, where he wants us to go, and what he wants to do with glory here. Is he calling you guys to form a team to come and serve in the Dominican Republic? Maybe it's not with Time Ministries in the DR. Maybe it's somewhere else. Maybe in Texas or in Florida. Uh, maybe in one of these other locations that has recently been, been uh, devastated by weather or other natural disasters. But it's a start, and all these things can apply to that as to whether or not God is calling you to serve. So with that, let's pray.